touch on in the past. What was it, four, four months, really, since um, the first one actually started? Uh, thank you, you all deserve a, a, a badge of Lennon and so on for actually doing this. Uh, not that I'm actually a big fan of Lennon, but never mind. So basically, this is the last lecture. Um, it is a conclusion and an overview. Well, I just really sum up a lot of my mad rantings and so on over the past four months. Um, the main purpose of the series of lectures has been to explore the political context really behind economic decision making. And I want to repeat really what I said in the first lecture, is that to actually assure people again who are under this delusion, economics is not a science. All right? It's not a science. Economic decisions are not scientifically based. Okay, essentially they're connected to political decisions. Economic decisions are often made with political outcomes and goals in mind. So when we go and you go to a stage one economics course as you do, and essentially the lecturer after a while starts putting up all sorts of mathematical uh, qualifications and so on like that, um, calculations about what could happen, it's all very, very subjective. So. The country's history, as we've seen, is really testament to the fact that economics is not a science. As a colony, then as a dominion, and later as an independent country, there is evidence of economic development being used in a political manner. The principal economic driver in this country has been, for the most part, the state or central government. And there are several reasons for this. One, of course, is the fact due to the small geographical size of New Zealand and the small population size. You have to remember that even now, New Zealand is smaller than London and a number of, a number of cities and so on in the UK who are run by local councils. So, you know, essentially we are quite pretty small, but we are geographically, and we're, you know, we're essentially, we're quite geographically sparse and isolated and so on as well. So it was a really a simple fact that the central government, particularly in the early years of the seat, was the only institution that was properly and ably resourced to actually undertake the role of being the economic driver, developing the infrastructure, and developing really the modern economic and political systems that we understand today. However, as we've seen, the support from the central government has changed over the past decades. And most notably, that change has been really, well, there have been three changes. One changed up to and after the 1890s. Then again, radical change after 1935. And then, of course, as we know, definitely radical change since the 1980s, and particularly since 1984. And in that change, the last change that we're actually still going through now was when the state was replaced by that of the market and, of course, the use of private capital to a degree probably not seen in New Zealand ever before. While the explanation behind this change was provided in economic terms, and that was that New Zealand was living simply beyond its means and the country was neither efficient nor effective, the motivations for the change in 1984, regardless of all this, were actually highly ideological. New Zealanders were told that the change towards monetarism or neoliberalism as opposed to Keynesianism was because there is no alternative. However, there were alternatives, as the discussion last time demonstrated, and those alternatives continue to exist even at this point in time. And I think it's really important to actually acknowledge that point that everything we've heard, particularly since 1984, always hinged on the fact that this had begun, there was no other reason, there was no other possibilities except to actually deregulate and to corporatise and privatise. There was no alternative. That was what Douglas said, it was what his cronies in the Fourth Labour Government said, it was what Richardson said, it was what that national government that followed said. It's still being said now, but there have always been alternatives to what they've actually said. So I also want to point out too that different economics also have different political outcomes. Hence again for
need for a close political connection. And I had to add that one of the motivating factors in this area for me was, as I mentioned in the first lecture, as to why there are different political outcomes for Labour parties in the UK and Australia as opposed to those in Sweden and in New Zealand in the 1930s. And that is that, as I might have said, one of the motivating factors was, for example, why was it that, in fact, the Scullin and Macdonald governments, and the Scullin government in Australia and the Macdonald governments in uh, the UK failed? Whereas, of course, our Labour Party succeeded, and so did the Social Democrats in Sweden. Okay, and that, that was my sense that, you know, essentially, why was that? Two Labour parties, one, two, both of them failed, and yet others succeeded. Now, the reason was because the economics that the UK and Australian Labour parties used at that time could not deliver what they wanted to achieve. Both Labour parties were committed to socialism, and to them, what this basically meant was a commitment to full employment, high wages and social provision, as well as emphasising public ownership as opposed to private ownership. However, the economics that they implemented, especially after the Wall Street crash in 1929 and the oncoming depression of the 1930s, was not designed to achieve any of those outcomes. So essentially, Macdonald, for example, and Snowden, who has his chance at the Exchequer, basically said at the time that they were there to actually improve the lot of the working classes. There were a lot of speeches by Snowden, particularly really low, and by Macdonald and so on about how the Labour Party was going to do this, how the need for the need for full employment, the need for workers' rights, etc., 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 and the creation of a socialist state. But yet every economic step they took basically meant that they could not achieve those rights. So essentially by cutting, by retrenching, by listening to uh, the UK uh, Treasury, essentially it actually took them further away from full employment, took them further away from social provision. It took undercut all the policies and so on that they stood on. But that was because the economics that they actually introduced and they stood by essentially were never designed to actually achieve those things like full employment, better conditions and so on and so forth. The emphasis on fiscal restraint and sound economics, which is really what they were talking about, and which they both called for and implemented during this time, undermined their own political goals. And as a result, instead of lowering wages, instead of higher, um, raising wages, they were lowered, they balanced budgets and unemployment rose and nothing was done that could jeopardise return to a functioning economy. Calls for public ownership at the time were largely unheeded and even if firms were nationalised and they were expected to run along sound business lines. However, As we have discussed, the advent of economists such as Keynes and his theory stood traditional economic practices on their head. What Keynes actually said was essentially was that the state could be used as a principal economic driver and in fact he encouraged it to be used in such a manner. Wages and payments could, should be increased to provide increased domestic demand and regulations and controls could be used to do the same. I have a quote here from Keynes because he became very much very favoured by the Labour Party here. No one has a better right to discuss the unemployment problem than Jane Keynes of Cambridge University, author of The Economic Consequences of the Peace, where he has been right so often. Looking back on the events since the war, we find he has been correct in his prophecies, which are statesmen, financiers, voters and many economists have been proven wrong. Larry Ross was actually one of the left wing of the New Zealand Labour Party who was, of course, writing in the New Zealand Herald at the height of the Depression in 1932. I'm sorry, New Zealand Worker at the height of the Depression in 1932. New Zealand Worker was the paper of the Labour Party and so on at that point in time before the standard. Now, the Swedish Social Democrats, 
and the New Zealand Labour Party chose the lack of set of economic policies and this was a result of them having seen what happened overseas and the effects, that was the effects of staying with conventional policies had on their sister parties. However, it was also because those parties recognised that the policies that were being promoted by Keynes, etc., could deliver their own objectives. So, in fact, what Keynes was suggesting could actually deliver things like high wages, full employment, uh, economic protection, social security, and so that was why they actually also went with them. Now, people within the NZLP, the New Zealand Labour Party, recognised the virtues and advantages of Keynes' proposal. As I said, in the March 1932 edition of New Zealand Worker, Lloyd Ross, as we said, lacks a lyrical about Keynes and his economic theories. And, of course, you know, he also said, and the Labour Party said at the time, that he said that the state had a considerable role in the policy as a regulator of the economy. The state's other role, they, the uh, Labour Party argued at that point, was essentially to ensure that funding was available to maintain domestic demand and consumption and production through active public works and development. Additionally, importance was given increasingly to maintaining domestic demand through consistently high rates of employment, i.e. the Labour Party is believed in New Zealand, and this was again core government policy all the way up to 1984, and the belief of full employment. And it wasn't just the fact that full employment was measured as NARU, the national rate of unemployment, or of employment, which was somewhere about 4%, I think that was the case, it was zero. It was zero. So everyone, as far as the Labour Party was concerned, was to have a job. And, you know, it was the state's obligation to create employment and to ensure that they were actually gainfully employed. And again, that was government policy in both Labour and national governments all the way up to 1984. Importance was given, as I said, to, uh, basically to increasing maintaining domestic demand through consistently high rates of employment and rates of pay and conditions will be determined by negotiation between employers and unions through a national system of arbitration or by regulation. And what that meant was essentially that unions were recognised on a national basis and essentially they would ne negotiate nationally with the employer and they would hammer out awards. The awards would be binding, as I said, across the country. Unions, interestingly too, uh, basically were also really um, delegated by their, by industrial, by essentially you join the union based upon what industry you're involved in. So the entire idea is we have the moment where you can have gigantic unions sprawling across, you know, essentially the political and industrial landscape, competing with each other, because that's another thing and so on that's come about since the late 1980s, the idea of competitive unionism, you know, where essentially um, unions can actually, you know, get the same, compete in the same areas, was an anathema. So basically the idea was you would belong, for example, you were a worker wattings like I did, then essentially there was one union that you joined, and that was it. So, now the decline of the state and the instigator of economic and political development has meant that other economic agents have been brought to the fore. And there are two I want to mention. The first of these is tax, and the second is the use of imports and free trade deals. Both areas have been at the centre of economic policy for the past 40 years, and the way in which they have been managed has had significant impacts on New Zealand's economic development. Also, additionally, touch very lightly on the use of exchange controls as these were used as significant economic tools by governments during this time. Now, without doubt, one of the most discussed and most argued instruments in New Zealand for recent political and economic history is the role and nature of taxation. And the reason for this is because tax serves two functions. Firstly, it's primarily about revenue gathering for the government, 
and taxes are what the government uses to fund the service and deliver these to the community. Schools, hospitals, police, public infrastructure, etc., are all funded by taxation. However, taxes also serve another purpose, and that they also allow for a degree of redistribution between the various sectors or classes in society. From the mid 1930s until 1984, most taxes were progressive. That is, that governments tended to tax people on the basis of what they earned, with the result that people who earned more were taxed a higher rate than those who earned less. Prior to the New Zealand early 1980s, people who are low paid workers, superannuitants, and beneficiaries paid no tax. So if you were a superannuitant, you were a student, you're unemployed, you're a low income worker, under Maldoon, you pay zero. And in fact, you only started paying taxes and so on when, in fact, you actually, I think, uh, I think it was sort of the middle range and so on. There. So in fact, you were actually, again, paid zero and so on when, if, in fact, you were a lower income worker. And when Roger Douglas was elected, they argued that this inequity was one of the reasons why, in fact, they had to actually, you know, make sure that everyone paid taxes. Because their complaint was that too many poor people were exempt from the tax, and that set up inequities within the taxation system. So, taxes also, prior to 1984, tended to be direct rather than indirect. So people know what I mean by direct and in indirect taxes? Yep, that's right, exactly. So direct taxation funded directly to government is largely based on what people earn, so you know, so basically pay. And essentially indirect taxation collected by a secondary source and is not based on what someone earns, such as GST. Now, since the mid-1980s, again, there's been a growth in the use of indirect taxes. And as I said, these are taxes that are levied through organisations who collect it on behalf of the government. Indirect taxes tend to be flat, and they're not based on a person's ability to pay. And one of the most noted ways of these, of course, is GST, which was introduced in 1986 by Roger Douglas. Now, debates over taxes have become, as I said, the central point of modern politics. Parties on the left have tended to support progressive and direct taxes for the simple fact that these are means by which wealth and economic power can be redistributed. Okay, so essentially if you can also take money off a rich person, that actually lessens their power that they can exert over the economy. That's why most socialist parties have always argued, in fact, Marx himself argued for graduated, heavily graduated taxes. However, for the parties of the right, the argument around taxes is tied up with the arguments around property and economic rights. And those of you who read the speeches of our Arnold Rimmer um, counterpart, um, David Seymour, will be more than aware and so on of that. They argue that the payment of taxes is an infringement of people's rights, and the argument is that those who produce the taxes, i.e. the owners of capital, should be allowed to keep the profits of their work. Neoliberals have argued that governments should be limited and that taxes should be spent on what is only necessary, such as those state agencies required to maintain law and order and civil obedience. Okay? They've also argued that by actually letting the owners of capital, the rich, actually keep more taxes, that would somehow or other magically trickle down through the economy and therefore everyone will benefit. Okay? And this, again, has been an argument that's been around since the late 1970s. This is their principal argument. The result of this argument has been in the last 40 years, there's been actually a decline in the rate of taxes paid by those on upper incomes, but an increase in taxes overall paid by those on lower or middle incomes. And this has been 
because of the flattening of the tax system and the three of the two into the smaller bands and the large introduction of more and more um, indirect taxes. Um, also, I mean, there's plenty of evidence now to prove that the idea that in fact it's trickling down is just not happening and due to the massive rise of inequality in terms of wealth and ownership and so on that has actually been about since the late 1970s. So, I mean, there's been lots of statistics on that. Even Treasury, our own Treasury, which is hardly a left-wing heartbreaker, has actually admitted that, in fact, yeah, yeah, there's a lot more inequality in New Zealand than there actually used to be in the 1970s. It's just like, well, how did this happen? I don't know. So, you know, so that's it. So, the other thing, too, is actually look just on that point, really about the proportion of wealth paid by the wealthy. Because, you know, you always hear from people like ACT and National and by Labour about how New Zealand is actually overtaxed. You know, how we're actually, even now, you know, basically labouring under the burden of high tax rates. And it's better to look at what the proportion of, uh, say, in income people pay in tax rather than just the amount, so as to avoid simply saying the rich pay the most tax because they earn their highest incomes. Now I have a graph here that looks at how much of the income different groups pay in income tax and GST combined, and it shows that the very rich don't pay that much more of their income in those taxes that the poor do. That's even though, though the wealthier benefit is the most from New Zealand's health system, schools, and other infrastructure, and can most afford to pay for those things to continue. Sorry. So that's the portion of wealth paid by the wealthy. So you see here that essentially, uh, it doesn't really come out of the song in this one regrettably, but in fact when you look at it, it actually shows that the by far the proportion of uh, basically wealth by the wealthy has decreased, while the gap and so on that those paid and so on by those in middle and income and lower incomes have actually increased and so on over this point. The other thing that's important to note too is, you know, this wonderful little graph that came out a couple of weeks ago that I just couldn't help but actually put in. And this is the uh, single worker with no children earning a nation's average wage in 2020. And here's the OECD average. And here, right at second to last, of just above Cuba, uh, Chile and Colombia, is New Zealand. Don't look so happy. <laughs> so it proves that in fact, far from being actually overtaxed, New Zealanders are actually by and large dramatically undertaxed in terms of the OECD. So you know, this is how things have changed. So when you look at it and so on, you look at basically countries like, for example, uh, basically Denmark, the Scandinavian countries and so on, tend to be up here. We tend to be below the OECD average. That's how much our tax rates and taxes and so on have actually fallen since 1984 and where they are now. Who's top of the list there? Because it's hard for us to read the financials. What was that, sorry? Who's top of the list? It's hard for us to see this one. I think it's Belgium. Belgium. Top of the list is Belgium, followed by Germany, Austria, France, Italy, Czech Republic, Hungary, Slovenia, Sweden, Latvia, Portugal, Slovak Republic, Finland, Greece, and yeah. So you run all the way down here if you reach the OECD average. So, so those are mostly countries that have um, you know, state-of-the-art functioning infrastructures. Yes, that's right, those, those poor, poor countries. If they'd only had free markets like we did, you know, they'd just be so fantastically rich. So you can see, uh, you know, I, mean, I think it really sums up, you know, essentially the fact that, you know, the fact that we're even below Mexico. What's the percentage there, Quentin? Can I say, is it? Was it was oh, it, yeah, it's, it's very hard to believe. Is it still 20% there? Yeah, there is, and I think... It is 19.1. 19, 19. 
<laughs> Chile is on 7.0 and Colombia is on zero. <laughs> I'm not going, even going to say where most of their tax money goes, but yeah. So the other thing I wanted to talk about, like I said, the other principal thing, of course, has been essentially import control and free trade. Now this has been the other major driver since the 1980s. Import controls and exchange rates were the mainstay of Keynesian economic theory, and the purpose of these controls was to both have direct control into and over aspects of the economy and to develop industry in specific areas that could benefit the wider economy. In the 1930s, New Zealand's economy was based on primary industry. Uh, primary industry is that industry. Um, basically dealing with farming and agricultural goods. New Zealand supplied mostly wool and lamb and dairy to the United Kingdom as part of its trade obligations as a British colony dominion, and there were only slight controls on goods as the British tended to operate free trade within the empire. Now the situation changed with the Dominions becoming more independent in the 1930s and, more importantly, with the rise of the Great Depression. And so in 1932, British colonies and Dominions had an economic conference in Ottawa, and the conference admitted the failure of the gold standard and abandoned attempts to return to it. Uh, people was that um, our economy and those of the UK was actually on, um, based on the gold standard. Uh, Winston Churchill, of course, was very committed to the gold standard, as was Snowden, but essentially it became very, and then very apparent sign in the late 1920s and early 30s that it had failed and was actually causing economic uh, chaos as a result. So they left it. The meeting also established a zone of limited tariffs within the British Empire, but with high tariffs for the rest of the world. Okay, so essentially, if you were a member of the British Empire, you paid very low tariffs, but basically, if you're outside the empire, you paid very high tariffs for actually trade. This was called imperial preference or empire free trade. On the principle of home producers first, empire producers second, and foreign producers last. The result of the conference was a series of bilateral agreements that would last for at least five years with the imposition of control and tariffs. New Zealand, as a primary producer, was very keen to ensure guaranteed markets for its primary gold goods and protection for the same sector. This guaranteed markets also allowed the incoming Labour government to implement a policy of guaranteed prices to farmers as a means of ensuring that their incomes and that of the primary sector remained high and prevented economic recession. So essentially, the one of the main things during the 1930s had been, of course, the collapse of New Zealand's farming um, industry, uh, which had led, of course, to essentially um, a collapse of New Zealand's economic reserves and so on, and essentially the new government, or rather the Labour Party, was uh, committed to essentially keeping farmers' incomes high, and that could be achieved through guaranteed prices. Announcing the new import and exchange policy in 1938, Michael Joseph Savage emphasised the need for them to do two things. One was to stabilise the economy, the other one was to use to stabilise and grow New Zealand's productive sectors. Because we want to transfer much of our imports to Britain, we are adopting a policy of import selection. Because we are going to build New Zealand's industries, we need to protect our imports. Because we want to protect our standard of living, especially when overseas prices fall, we have chosen this method of import selection. So that's what Savage said in 1938. In the late 1950s, the second Labour government used these controls as a means of extending New Zealand's industrial base and establishing new secondary industries. And so under um, Nordmeyer and Nash, there were all sorts of plans and so on to actually discover, uh, for example, establish new woolen mills and so on like that, Nelson, 
they wanted to actually expand, expand railways and shipping and so on as well to actually find it to actually service these new mills and so on like that. So they had lots and lots of plans. And of course, the idea of import controls and selection was at the center of those economic plans and so on, and those infrastructural plans. Um, they wanted to, as a result of that, it would have had the effect of diversifying New Zealand's economy away from its total reliance on primary products. They were very keen on secondary manufacturing. And to this end, the government, as I said, established a number of new initiatives and fostered the creation of an industrial development fund. Agreements were signed overseas companies to construct an aluminium industry using cheap power from hydroelectric projects in Lake Siano and Manapuri. I think we remember know what happened there, Dennis. Yes. And of course, uh, basically our cotton mill in Nelson, which required the construction of a railway line to connect Nelson with the main South Line, Island Line. Now the incoming national government cancelled the Nelson project, but continued with a number of others, such as the dam building and stuff like that, and of course we know about Kamalco and so on in the South Island at Cargill. Again though, there was a belief in, in the use of import controls as a means of economic and industrial development, and this really continued until the 1980s, when the government basically said that these things were uh, basically passe, they lead to inefficiencies, and really what we needed was the market to actually set New Zealand's imports and its economic development. Now what this meant was the outcome of this change meant that a number of industries that had relied on controls and production and production subsequently became uneconomic as they could not compete with the increasing number of cheaper international imports. And as a result, many New Zealand firms succumbed to large corporates that increasingly dominated the New Zealand economy. Now, again, Act the National will make a big thing about how, in fact, the Labour Party and, you know, state intervention and Maldoon and so on destroyed, you know, the small mum and dad industries that were scattered throughout the country, generating all this wealth. But in actual fact, when you look at the figures, the, the real zenith of sort of small private firms, you know, what you can call this petty bourgeoisie, you know, corner shops and dairies and so on, was actually during this time of state regulation in the 1950s, 60s and 70s. And the reason for that was because of the fact that the regulations protected them and actually helped them to actually grow. And you think about it, for example, supermarkets had to shut at 5.30. So if you wanted anything, you had to go to the damn dairy and actually get it. You know, that all the local firms, for example, like Car Rubber and Scanner Up and Hayrides and Woolworths and so on like that, were all growing under this period of time and achieved national status because of the fact that they were protected by import controls and so on from unfair overseas conditions. When, in fact, they reduced those conditions, they lowered those barriers, they got rid of selected licensing and barrier and um, controls and so on, they were swamped by overseas goods that they couldn't compete against. So again, I, I actually would argue that, in fact, the, the real zenith was actually produced by the state in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, and all the free markets has done is actually undermine small business people and so on, and in fact, you know, sort of the uh, mum and dad enterprises and so on since the 1980s. So, by the mid-1990s and early 2000s, the New Zealand economy relied on primary exports and tourism and hospitality sectors. So, in fact, we've done away with our secondary manufacturing base that has been subsequently dismantled. A lot of the other things and so on that this has actually done, like our shipping, New Zealand used to actually own a shipping line and so on as well, and had control of the ports and so on. That's all been done away with, with the result that we've actually gone backwards to the 1930s, when in fact we're now heavily relying again on primary industry to actually pay our way. And of course, um, also with a large dole of service, hospitality industries and tourism as well, because tourism came about in the 1980s as a big thing. 
And as we're seeing as a result of COVID, that has ceased to be the big thing and is now being kept afloat by the state. So, so that's where really where we are now. Now, in terms of exchange controls, these were introduced at the same time as import controls. Um, Industrialisation was pursued both as a means of import substitution and develop more, a more mature um, industry or economy. Exchange controls were implemented at roughly the same time as import controls and were a means of being better able to control the New Zealand economy. Now, the Reserve Bank had been established in 1933 by the coalition government, but was actually privately run at that point. In 1936, the incoming Labour government nationalised the Reserve Bank. And that meant that the government was able to both print and issue its own currency and to ensure that the government could better control and stabilise its economy through the use of the Reserve Bank. And one of the things, of course, it did with the Reserve Bank was to use it to actually borrow against so it could build thousands and thousands and thousands of state houses. It also discouraged speculation, as the government could set the rate of the currency implemented in 1938 as a response to a crisis of two New Zealand's balance of payments. So in 1938, for example, New Zealand uh, essentially had had a balance of payments crisis, mainly because of the fact that if you read John A. Lee, and essentially Lee's argument was that Nash, who was very much opposed to import controls and exchange controls, refused to actually do anything about it until the crisis met, uh, until the crisis came along. He was forced to go to Britain and borrow more money from the British at very humiliating terms. And it would have actually, as Lee has actually been admitted by Nordmeyer later on, actually done great damage to New Zealand's um, development and so on at this point, if in fact Hitler had not invaded, um, what was it, Poland at the same time, Whereas the British said, of course we can give these terms. You know, all that stuff you cite, you forget that. You pay us back when you have to pay us back. So, you know, essentially that meant that New Zealand got a better deal mainly because of the fact that war came along. Now, New Zealand's economy, for the most part, or currency, was sorry, was either fixed or operated on a crawling peg. A fixed exchange rate is one where the exchange rate is fixed against another currency or a measure of value. So it could be the gold standard. In the years after the war, it was basically the value of the New Zealand of the United States dollar, which had been uh, basically decided at what was called the Bretton Woods Conference and so on like that, I think about 1946 or 47. A crawling peg exchange rate allowed for some movement and adjusting. So essentially crawling peg fixed would mean completely fixed. Crawling peg would allow you to actually have an upper limit and a lower limit, in which time if it reached either of those, the government could intervene. The New Zealand currency tended to be originally linked to the British pound sterling, and then later, as I said, to the US dollar. Now, exchange and currency controls remained in place until 1984-85 when the incoming Labour government lifted them on the pretext that they interfered with market mechanisms and did not allow either investment and or speculation. Now there's an interesting point about this and I'm sure that all of you who saw uh, basically the docker a couple of weeks ago and so on about um, oh, what was the name someone of else's country? That was it, someone else's country. Well, would mention the fact that essentially Roger Douglas was completely and absolutely supportive of the idea of devaluation and had gone around major finance and business leaders in New Zealand and essentially said to them, look, regardless of what the Labour Party policy is saying, I'm telling you when I'm Minister of Finance, we will devalue and we will have a floating currency. Now, business leaders used that because New Zealand had a fixed currency at this point to transfer their money overseas and speculate against New Zealand currency. 
when Maldun, who knew about this, essentially refused to follow the incoming government's directions to devalue, thus setting off basically what they call the uh, constitutional crisis, the exchange rate crisis, he did it on the basis that, in fact, he knew that there was nowhere that these people would take their money except back here. But he was overruled, he was forced to devalue, these people came back and cleaned up. And as a result, New Zealand's currency since that date has really been at the mercy of overseas markets. And I remember at home, I've actually got a manifesto from the New Zealand party, which was a party that was set up by Bob Jones in 1983, and it was sort of a proto-act party. And in that, Bob Jones speculates that by actually having a floating exchange rate, New Zealand would wipe off all its debt within years. He said that the country would be out of debt. So, you know, I want people to speculate and so on, on that and, and think about the amount of debt that we have both personally and, of course, um, in terms of, you know, the country's debt and realise that these people have really been saying this for a very, very long time. It's been completely false. In fact, what the devaluation did do, and what the, uh, basically, the, the movement from a crawling peg to market or floating exchange rate did, was actually increased by three to four times individual debt in this country. So every person now is more individually indebted than they were prior to 1984. Again, that's hardly ever mentioned, of course, by either National or Act of Labour or something like that. So, with that, <coughs> what next? This is where, you know, I'm going to... Well, economics reigns in a state of flux, along with the politics that drives it. The international situation has changed dramatically since the beginning of the century, with some commentators remarking that it resembles more of the 1920s and 1930s, and not in a good way. The impact of COVID and issues such as the Ukraine, etc., will continue to have significant impact on how we govern ourselves and the economic circumstances that we find ourselves in. However, there are long-term issues that also will impact. The most significant of these is, without doubt, climate change, which will affect most nations in the coming decades. The impact of the economies and political practices will be immense and the cost will be measured in the billions. Given the significance of these impacts, it remains relevant to ask what people want an economy to deliver to them and how, therefore, should it be structured. An economy that relies on inequality as a mechanism to deliver economic goals is not necessarily the best one to secure social well-being and cohesion. A number of domestic and international reports have warned of the considerable increase in inequality in the past 30 to 40 years. And in a recent article on the subject, inequality researcher Max Rushbrook noted that instead of the top 10% owning 59% of the wealth, as suggested by Stats New Zealand estimates, they probably own more about 70% of it. He concedes, he concedes, instead of owning 20% of the wealth, the top 1% probably have closer to a quarter of it. Inequality not only reduces well-being, but the effects of it also undermine economic productivity. Simply, a happy, inclusive society is a more productive society. The Scandinavian countries outrank New Zealand in terms of economic growth and production, despite them being more economically regulated and consequently less economically free. So Sweden, Denmark, Finland, and all those countries who have more regulated economies have always been far more productive than us. They've never been really top, but they've been consistent over the past 40 years, whereas New Zealand has not been at all. Again, our productivity has fallen and so on since, since the 1980s. Now, in the 1900s, there was a joke that New Zealanders were so impassioned about equality there was a surprise that there was not a statue dedicated to it in Wellington Harbour. One of the reasons for this passion was because most New Zealanders of British or European stock had actually fled their homelands 
due to the immense poverty and repression that existed there. There was a desire as a result that the evils of the old country should not be imposed upon the new. This was a motivating factor of the schemes and programs of the governments of whatever shade attempted to introduce. And I think it's still something important that we really need to actually ask ourselves now essentially about how we're going to actually achieve that and what sort of country we want. I think, just as a final conclusion, I mean, this has been a lot of this stuff and so on I haven't actually dealt with for the past 20, 30 years. I used to be very heavily involved and so on, you know. And one of the things that always got me about it was that the left was always used to be very good at economics. We basically talk, used to talk about society, but we used to be able to actually say how it economically could be done. We could actually critique right-wing economics. And we're not so good at it now at all. And in fact, it would be fair to say that the left is pretty effing appalling at economics and so on at the moment. And I'm reminded and so on that when the new Labour Party was formed, one of the things that we used to do was basically set out, and I brought them along, I just couldn't resist it, was a whole lot of alternative budgets. They basically set out what the party was going to do, how it was going to do it, how much it would cost the lot. Anderton made us do it. And at the time, as a young socialist activist and so on in the NLP, I used to be really frustrated by these things because, of course, you really just want to build a new society and you know how dare that you're being actually being asked to actually figure out how much you know basically free education and so on might actually cost and so on like that and Jim Flynn of course who was my mentor used to actually work out the alliance tax rates and so on over milk and cookies and his um and his lounge and stuff like that he was very hot on it and at the time like I said I chuffed a lot about them but now in retrospect I see the sense for them I see the sense about why we have to actually think about economics and why, and though, yes, it's, it's not that passionate, yeah, and it's not that exciting and so on like that, but it's a necessary, it's a necessary evil to actually think about these things. And, like I said, I think it's to the left's shame and probably to its, um, to its loss, actually, that we don't think about these things anymore. And with that, I will end you. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to finish my beer. Thank you. <laughs>